Thank you, Brother Herman. I have just been sitting here drinking in. And, uh, you know, uh, I appreciate it very much. And before we go any farther, I'm sure we just we overlooked it. Uh, I think this was a wonderful little breakfast that these people served us here this morning. I've uh, eaten breakfasts around the world, you know, in different nations. And that was a real nice little breakfast. And I believe it would be, as we are Christian gentlemen and ladies, to leave a little something lay on the table for those nice little ladies, how nice they serve us, you know, if you have a little, you know. It's American custom, I think, that we leave them a little something on the table. And by the way, I ought to be saying that when I haven't even paid for my own ticket yet, but I... <laughs> Somebody I owe the ticket to, so I, I imagine, why don't you just lay it at your plate and let the lady, that, would that be all right? Yes. Oh, just lay it, some, before we leave, just before we go away, just leave a little something on the table, and I hope they're not listening, but see, we hold an example. Let's be an example, see? And so let's be real Christians in all that we do or say and ever act, let's be real Christians. And... I know it's in our hearts. Sometimes we can easily forget little things like that, but this all that I'd mentioned. Uh, I believe uh, uh, the Scripture says how great or precious for a brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the, uh, the oil that was on Aaron's beard that run down to the hems of his garment. We can certainly say that this morning with real trueness of heart, that it was really a, a fine fellowship. I have had many meetings, seen many things by the grace of God. I never met any finer bunch of men, just real Christian brothers with all of us um, just together. I know this is a little breakfast, but I hope this, now it's not a joke, it's something actually happened, but it's just a little something that might change the position of our thoughts for a moment. I love to fish, and uh, I go way high in the mountains sometimes to fish. Now, I've got a lot of brothers here. I know the same thing. I just looked at them and watched one another then. So, uh, sister, don't argue with him. Let him fish. That's good for him. <laughs> He's, he, go with him. I said the other day to my little girl, Rebecca, she said, Ah, when I get married, I'll never marry a hunter. Mm. So I see what my mother's went through. It's all right. And marry a golf player and let him get out there on the out there with them half-dressed women and everything all day long. You know she thought about it, come back and said, You know, Daddy, I just haven't changed my mind. So I want to marry a preacher and let him be a hunter that I want to go with him. <laughs> so you had it all figured out. Uh, all right. I was fishing one time way in top of northern New Hampshire. That's the home of the little brown brook. You get the native trout that's really high. They're good fighters, but the... The others are the stock, the hatchery fish are soft, and there's not much fight in them. So I used to put a little pup tin on my back and walk maybe miles, three or four days walk, way high on top of the mountains where the past the beaver dams and everything, where you get into where the real native trout's at. Oh, how I love to catch those little fellows, catch them and turn them loose, just to, just to catch them, that's all. Just to relax yourself. You've got to have something to relax. So especially in this type of ministry. And um, so Mr. Gold here is teaching me how to hand load shells now, and so yeah, I'm getting along pretty good at that. So um, up there one day I had a little pup tent setting up, and I'm not a good cook. I couldn't boil water without scorching it. I'm telling you, I'm just a, uh, just a bad cook, but I, I can cook flapjacks, or excuse me, I, I, I mean pancakes, you know, that we, we call them. Um, well, uh, we call them everything. Out west, we call them sweat pads. You know what a sweat pad is? <laughs> Those are the horse's saddle, you know. <laughs> and so um, we always called them down in Kentucky flapjacks. And, uh, uh, of course, really, they're pancakes. And you don't have to mix up anything. Put a little of this powdered milk with them, mix them up, and pour them out. And, um, of course, you all know that I am was a Baptist, and I believe in immersing. I don't like to sprinkle them. I really like to pour it on them, you know, just cover them up real good with uh, honey. And I like honey because that's good for Baptist morale, you know, they, like John, you know, it eats the honey. And so then um, I had me a little half a gallon bucket full of honey there. And one morning, 
I, way down along the creek, I had a, a place, a hole there, where just full of little brown brooks, about 12, 14 inches long, and oh, they were just like a team of mules almost in it, in of us, one of them fly lines. But there's some bushes in my way. I couldn't whip that coachman fly enough to get up there to where they see my shadow in the water. So then um, I took my little hatchet and went out there that morning early. I thought I'll go down and chop them bushes down so I could whip the fly and get back there and get some of them big ones out from under that um, place where the water poured in. They get back high in the deep water. So I went out and chopped it down, caught a few, and was on my road back. I brought two back for my breakfast. Before I got up to my little tent, I heard a noise, and that country is full of these little old black bear. Oh, don't get, some of them get pretty good size, five or six hundred pounds, but this long and last of May, and there was, um, there was an old sow, or what's your mother bear, and her two cubs had got into my tent. Well, it isn't what they eat, it's what they destroy. They just love to destroy anything. So I had a little stove up there cooking. They just got down and got that stove pipe and jumped up and down went like that just to hear it crack, you know. And they tore up everything there was in there. And um, one of them had found my bucket of honey. So they love anything sweet, you know. And so when I come up, the old mother bear, she uh, heard me coming, so very sensitive. And she run off and she cooed to her cubs. Well, they're little, cute little fellows. And usually when something like that, you haven't got your camera, you know, to get it. And a uh, little cub, one of the little cubs run off. The other one just sat there. I thought, what's the matter with the little fellow? And she cooed again, but he didn't come. He just sat there and had his head down. Oh, what's the matter with that little guy? Well, I had an old axe man and an old rusty rifle hanging in the tent, but I guess it tore all to pieces by that time. And I wouldn't want to have killed her anyhow because it left two orphans in the woods. So I thought, well, I, I kept a tree in mind because with them cubs, she'll scratch it, you know. So I, I thought, well, now... If I could just see what that little fellow is so curious, he was just, well, I said, why didn't he come when his mammy called him? So I kept stepping this way and watching a tree. So walking out, I thought, what's the matter? I said, hey, get out of there. And uh, he just stayed there. And I was the old mother cub and the other, old, and, the, and the cub and the mother walking around, cooing, you know, and her calling this cub and he wouldn't move. And I thought, now there's something he's found that he's interested in. When I got sideways, that little fellow had my bucket of honey. And he had it like this in his little paw, you know, and he got the lid off of it. Now, he didn't know really how to eat it, so he'd take his little paw and stick it down like this, you know, and lick. <laughs> and lick. And I got around, and I laughed at him a little bit, and I said, Get out of there! And he turned and looked, and his eyes were full of honey. He couldn't see me on his batting around looking at me like that is just all over his little belly you know just as full of honey as he could be and I thought if he isn't having a Pentecostal jubilee I never <laughs> no condemnation no fear just had his hand in the honey bucket <laughs> just a lick I think that's something what we've had this week <laughs> don't care who says anything that's what reason we're Pentecostal I don't care what the rest of them says. We're worshiping God. So we just got our hands in the honey bucket from up to her elbows and just been licking. Maybe don't cease so far, you know, but we're full of honey. You know, the strange thing about to finish our little story, you know what happened, Dan? When finally he got the bucket licked out, I just stayed and let him have a good time. So, <laughs> so after he got through, he staggered off, went over there, and the others licked him. <laughs> So if they didn't get in the meeting, they'll lick. <laughs> just keep testing. Yes, the mother and the other were just licking him as hard as he could. That's getting just some of the leavings, you see. So, but he had his hand in the honey. Fellowship, nothing like it. Old Doctor Bosworth said to me one day, he said, "Brother Branham, you know what fellowship is?" I said, "I think so." He says it's two fellows in one ship. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's about right. It's glad to see my neighbor here this morning is Brother Fred Sothman, one of the trustees of my church. Brother Banks Woods, another trustee of our church tabernacle at Jeffersonville. I just wish you two brethren would stand up just a moment, if you will, Brother Fred, if it wouldn't make those other people to know there's two of our trustees at the church. Yeah. And um, 
We have other friends here. Their wives and loved ones are here. And uh, I'd like to make a remark about Brother Woods, his wife sitting there. It's his neighbors to me. Mr. Woods is a contractor. Mr. Softman is a farmer from Canada. Brother Welch Evans sitting over here in the corner, another loyal brother. These two brethren sitting there, one a Canadian, the other from Georgia. Their wives here. They, um, they drive about a thousand miles each way every Sunday when I preach at the tabernacle. That's loyal coming. Very fine friends. And uh, Mr. Woods being a contractor, he was by, raised in a loyal family of Jehovah Witness. And he um, had a crippled boy. Uh, infantile paralysis and, and drawed his leg up. And his wife, I think she belonged to the Church of God, Anderson Church of God. Or Methodist. Which was it, Sister Wood? Was it Anderson Church of God? And so they had, somebody had told them about us having a meeting in Louisville and they went down there and they seen one night there a little boy taken from a wheelchair that was a spastic Paralysis and walked to the platform. The little fellow sold an anointed with the Holy Ghost and preached over the platform. A young lady that the doctors had gave up that had that disease that she turned to chalk. And she way up in her waistline, she hadn't moved for four or five years. And here, rose from the stretcher on, thus saith the Lord, run up and down the platform, up from everywhere, perfectly normal and well. Their hearts begin to hunger for God. Mr. Woods at that time, being a contractor, had a job he had to finish real quick, and he and his wife went to Houston, Texas, where the Baptist minister challenged for a debate. And let's let him challenge. God always works at this right. There's where the picture of the angel of the Lord was taken. As you see, Mr. Woods was setting present when it come down. I went from there to Finland, Sweden, all the Scandinavian countries. On the road back, I went to a city next to where this young man came to the Lord when I was preaching. This is one of my children <laughs> from the, the ministry, Brother Hill. Now, I think that was right, Brother Hill. And um, hearing these other brothers, how different things that come off. And I'm getting old now, and so um, it makes me think of these young boys coming on will take my place after a while. I'm so glad to see them. The one thing I've longed to be when I've seen the assembly, Church of God, pilgrims and different kinds. Yeah, I, I would be ready to say this morning like Simeon, Lord, let thy servant depart in peace when I could see him one heart and one accord just melt together. <laughs> Satan keeps you firing at one another. He don't have to fire at all. See? You just whip yourself. See? When I see that great ransom church of God come together as one great unit, I'll close up the book then and pass it back to my son Joseph and say, Billy, Carry it on, son. My other children, my sons, move on now. And stay that way. The millennium will be on when that takes place. Now, Mr. Woods came to... Brother Woods, what was the name of that city in Ohio? Cleveland. We had a big tent meeting there, and you could hardly get around him. And his, him being a Jehovah Witness now, and his father and mother... Strict Jehovah Witness, all of his father's a reader, and sitting way back in the meeting, and he was a little crippled boy, the Holy Spirit moved out, and I don't know just the words it said, I'd say something like this, that the man back there that's uh, got the boy, it's the, his wife, or maybe from Kentucky or what, you know how it usually does, that the boy that had the crippled leg is now healed, thus saith the Lord. The boy don't even know which leg it was. He has to sit down and study. It was so perfectly made straight. And his brother, being a Jehovah Witness, came down. They excommunicated him right quick when he did that. Mr. Wood stopped his contracting and bought a little house next door to me as a, really a Pentecostal Christian. I don't say that. No, or he is sitting here, but uh, they've been real neighbors, real people. My house, I never had to worry about anything about his there. Just if the yard needs cutting, he cuts it and just anything like that, just to be near. Brother Fred Softman, many of these, Brother Tom Simpson sitting there, those men came from Canada. Just to, they're camping out there 
Been in there for two years now in a trailer just to be near when we have service. Oh, what that friends like that, what it means to you. Now, it's glorious to have a precious friend. So Brother Woods' brother, Lyle, came down one day, and I guess he wanted to ask him what kind of a, a shenanigan he got hooked up with. And so he said, that's the brother out there cutting grass and harvest and the mow overhauls on, straw hat. I come in talking to him, and it happened to be the Holy Spirit come near and begin to tell him about him being a married man, having two children, and so forth. So he, he uh, thought, well, Banks told him that. And I caught that what he thought. And so people saying that don't realize that you realize what they're thinking. See, you, God revealed this what's in their heart. But, you see, they, they don't really don't believe it. So I said, but here's one thing Banks didn't tell me. Last night you come here getting your head shot off. <laughs> your wife that you're married to which is with a red-headed woman last night. She had you hid in the room, and it's a one knocking at the door, and you sent her to the door. If it hadn't, that man would have blowed your brains out. That got him. <laughs> he knew that was true. We went fishing together down the dock, and we'd run out of bait. And so we were sitting there one morning. I was catching these little bluegills on a fly line to bait up with that night. And his uh, brother said... Uh, I said, the Holy Spirit is near. He wants to see something fixing to happen. I said, it's perhaps a resurrection going to take place. I said, maybe it's perhaps I've got about 500 on the list there, little children and everything. I said, maybe something's... Then I have to think, maybe before I left, it was... <laughs> Excuse us, sisters. Uh, I don't like a cat. I just can't stand it. <laughs> and so they... I, I'm not afraid of them. But, ooh, that creepy feeling they give me. So they... Uh, my little girl went down the lane and heard another little neighbor girl come up and she said, oh, daddy, you know, she got that real sad look. She said, somebody throwed out a, a poor cat and it's eat something and said it's in the office condition, that it, it's poison, it's going to die. And said, daddy, you wouldn't mind me keeping that cat, would you? And I said, well, if it's going to die, I said, I guess not. We said, would you pray for it? We just prayed for a little dog, you know, it was just dying, and he got all right, big, fine dog now. So, And you've read the story of the possum and all those things. It's, oh, God, that's his creation. Same as, so I said, let me see the cat. So her and another little girl packed it around the house, and I said, well, yes, we'll keep it. Go get a box. And the next morning we had about ten kittens, you know, and so then so they had them. So my little boy, Joseph, got out and... He um, looked at one of them, and he's just a little bitty fella, and he squeezed it too tight and throwed it down. I thought he killed the little thing. It wiggled around there a few times. I thought, perhaps it's that kitten, you know, I want to go back. That cat will be dead, and the Lord just raise it up. So next morning, we were fishing, Mr. Woods there, and his brother and I. We pulled into a little cove, and we were catching nice-sized brim, you call them here, I think, bluegill. We call them down there in Kentucky, on the mountains breeze blowing in. It's a beautiful morning. And Lyle was sitting there with not a fly line, but the hook looked to me like he was going to catch whales on it. And he had a worm all wormed on it. He dropped it over there and the, instead of catching the fish, he just let it get, swallow the hook from down his little belly. And, then, and when he got out, he said, now looky here what I got. <laughs> a little fella about that long. So he just caught it with his hand, full of stomach, gills and all. One thing he could do Cause the hook was plumbed down his little belly instead of catching him, you know. And I said, um, and he pulled his little stomach out and threw him out on the water like that. And said, and he quivered four or five times, his little fin stretched out. He said, you shot your last wad, little fella. And uh, he's kind of a tall country boy, like anyhow. I said, now, Brother Lyle, you see, you never let a fish swallow the hook. I said, take us the tip of bait, and just as soon as he hits it, hook him like that. And... Uh, we were sitting there talking, and the little fellow laid around on the water for about a half hour, and a little breeze got up and blowed him back against the bank. We were sitting there talking and catching these fish, and I un unhooked him. I not to kill the fish, because I had at least 200 or more, I guess, for the banks on the lines, out on our trout lines. So we caught the day before and cut them up, put them on the line. we just show you what God does, how he's concerned about everything. All of a sudden, something comes sweeping down those hills like a wind. Raised up in the boat, 
said, stand on your feet. I raised up and said, speak, and it'll be so. I said, what? There lays that dead fish. I said, little fishy, I give you your life in the name of Jesus Christ. The little fishy turned over like that and went swimming out through the water, laying there in his stomach, pulled out of its mouth and its gills. Now, this Bible's open before me. Is that true, Brother Woods? Mr. Lyle Woods just pitched over at the boat. He said, that meant me. Because I said to that little fish, you've been dead about a half hour. Said, I said, you shot your last water. I said, no. He said, Brother Branham, why would God use his power to bring that little fish to life? And I seen on that book of dozens of spastic children. I don't get that. I said, one time he came out of the city of Jerusalem where there were people that were laying there with leprosy and dying in all conditions. Moved out, and he seen a tree. Didn't have no food on it. He said, curse that tree. And the tree wilted. Used his power on cursing a tree and people laying up there dying by the hundreds with leprosy and all kinds of diseases. It just goes to show that God is interested, no matter how insignificant, how little, how big, he's interested in all his nature. So if our churches are little, whether they're large, whether you're a lay member, whether you're a housewife, whether you're whatever you are, God knows and he's interested in you and in what you're doing for him. That is true. So we are happy this morning to know that we serve a God like that. Now I got my income tax papers laying down here at the post office. And it closes, I think, at 11 o'clock this morning, so I can't preach over three hours. Sure. You forgive me for my foolishness, I suppose. But uh, even God has a sense of humor, you know. So, so we, uh, I have to say something to unwind myself. And uh, you, no one, my precious brother, sister, will never know what those visions do. Last night, after it got into the audience, the best of my memory, it all seems a dream to me after it happened. You are to follow Billy Paul sometime or those who have to take me along and shake me and kick me on the shin or talk about going fishing or something to get me out of that. It's not while you're up there. It's not while you're down here. It's while you're in between. See, then, like the prophet, when he'd give his message and, and call far out of heaven and, and rain out of heaven, and then for 40 days wandered in the wilderness, and God found him back in a cave. See, it's in between. It's not while I'm standing like I am now. Not when you're up there, you feel like you could turn the world upside down. But it's when you're in between those times. And I think they're going to have a dance in here after a while. I hope we do this morning, too. <laughs> Glory. A Pentecostal dance. <laughs> a Pentecostal dance. And um, notice that another thing I just like to say amongst Pentecostal people. There's one thing that we're forgetting, friends, is our Pentecostal courtesy. See, parking in lots, sometimes I've noticed our Pentecostal brethren, when you could really pull in and give somebody else a, a chance to park to the side of it, just drive in any way. Call somebody, it really makes a, what we call a boo-boo on the road, you fly loose and tear down. Listen, that's not the way to be a Pentecostal Christian. Let's consider the next man. If he's wrong, let him be wrong. If you pattern after him, then you're wrong. Let's think of the other fellows. And just try to do right and think right. I've got a slogan. Do right, your duty to God. Think right, that's your duty to yourself, and you've got to come out right. And if you'll try to practice the right thing, see, it'll grow around you just like a vine. It'll hug you into it. And if you can't love your enemy just as much as you love those who love you, there's something wrong somewhere. See? Now, not just think, it's my duty to love my enemy. You've got to really love him. I was sponsored by a group of people just recently. Fine people. Nothing against them. Their ideas is their ideas. I draw no lines. But this group of people, 72 churches sponsored, and they have a, a way of they baptize by immersing in a, a way that the others do not believe in baptizing that way. So, uh, this one uh, district presbyter called me and said, 
Brother Branham, you had a man on the platform last night that was baptized wrong. Well, maybe he was. And he said, well, we're just going to draw a little line. You're too compromising. I said, just a minute. I said, that brother had the Holy Ghost, didn't he? He said, well, he could not have his sins remitted because he wasn't baptized for the remission of his sins. I said, but God gave him the Holy Ghost. So if God accepted him like that, I do too. <laughs> and listen, I would rather be scripturally wrong and have the right kind of a spirit than be scripturally right and have the wrong kind of spirit. No. It's what's in you displays itself. That's what your, your life proves what you are. This man said, I'm, we're drawing a little rain, and we're drawing you out of our circles. I said, then I'm going to draw a little rain and draw you back in again. <laughs> so I, I to bring you right back. Uh, you can't put me out, because God put me in, see? So you can't, you can't put me out, so that's the way we're going to do, see? Believe that. You're a wonderful group of brothers. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is that like to that above. Let me say this to you as your brother, and I'm just past 26 years old the other day, you know. You know that, didn't you? I meant the second time, see? <laughs> so I don't know how long I'll be with you. I don't know about that. But let me tell you a little secret. The most powerful force in the world isn't speaking with tongues or interpreting tongues or being honored by God to be a minister or to be an evangelist or to be a prophet. The most powerful weapon that I've ever found in my life is love. You know, the filial love, which the Greek word comes from friendship like you have for your wife. There's a difference. It'll make a mother for that baby run to a blazing fire. Her life means nothing. That's filial. What will agapo do? See? The godly love. We must love, divinely love one another. Then you don't see your brother's mistake. If he does make a mistake, you never you look over the top of it and you love him anyhow. See? That's it. Love those that love you, then does not the sinner the same thing? But love those who doesn't love you. That's what shows the Spirit of God is in you, because he loved you when you were his enemy, and he loved you. And if that Spirit's in you, it'll make you love your enemy as you do your friend. Can we bow our heads just a moment after all this little talk that we could catch the word? Great Jehovah, we're an eternity-bound people. We're bowing our faces towards the dust from where we were taken. And if you tarry, someday, one by one, we'll go back into that dust. But at that resurrection morning, we'll meet. As I looked across this table this morning, as I have in many meetings, I looked up and down this line and out there, and I seen man, gospel preachers here sitting here that perhaps preached the gospel when I was a sinner boy. There's old gray-headed mothers here who's lounged their children at the table to help build these churches that these boys represent. I may never see them again after this meeting's over. We may never meet again in a breakfast in this earth. But there's one thing sure, we'll meet at a supper sometime in a better land. When we think about that great meeting in the sky when that great table is stretched across the canopies from eternity to eternity and all the redeemed of all ages sit around that table and we look across the table to one another no doubt a little tear will trickle down our cheeks remembering these meetings and times shake one another's hands and grip it with brotherly and sisterly love. Then the great king will come out, wipe all tears from her eyes, and say, Don't cry, children. It's all over. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Father, while it's daytime, while it's earth, and while we're in 
time and space, let us work with all that's in us to get every person there that we can to set in that great fellowship. Bless these men, these brothers, these some of these young men and old men and these women and these little children. We pray that you'll mightily bless them with your power and presence. May this meeting grow into one constant revival from church to church. May arm in arm and heart to heart, may we put our efforts together for the kingdom of God until we see Jesus. We ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. In the book of Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, we read, these words. And from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm going to take the little subject, watch that clock, the subject of from that time. Now there is uh, times that we can say from that time. There's times when as a young child, these ministers here could say, I was at a church and, uh, or I was out in the field or I was reading the Bible and from that time, a little boy, an old man, we have a certain time that something happens and then we say, from that time. The little boy can say, you know, uh, I never lied in my life. And one day I made a corn silk cigarette. And I got out behind the old fire chimney and, and I smoked this cigarette and got some coffee and put my mouth so Mama wouldn't smell it. And, and uh, she said, Junior, have you been smoking a red light? Don't lie, little boy. Don't lie. Conscience, don't lie. No. Mommy, you broke every barrier then. And from that time, I begin to lie. That's the way we start. We have to mark it from some time. Something happened. And from that time, it changed things. We all have those kind of times. The immoral woman walks on the street. She might have said, one time I was as pure as a lily. And as radiant as after the rain when the heavenly dew fell upon me and I was as pure as that lily. I was out with a boy that I thought to be a gentleman. One night he gave me a spiked coke. He kissed me in a way that he should not have kissed me. Instead of pulling away from him and slapping him in the face and going home, I throw myself into his arms, and from that time, there's always something. Then I throw my life away. I talked to such a woman the other day. She had her in a psychic ward. I went in to pray for her. She said, go back in straight jackets. That's really what last night would have been. The visions were going right along, calling those people from cots and things. But when the glory of God fell in that building, I couldn't even hear no more. You know why I sent them ministers down there? I want this audience to know and these people to know when I leave here that they don't have to send for me to pray for them. I wanted the people to know that these servants of God can lay their hands on the sick. It ain't nothing to one person. It's we are a group of people. We are a family of God. Going into this emergency room, there was a beautiful young woman sitting there. Great brown eyes and dark hair. She looked like she'd been a queen for any man's palace. How do you do? She said, how do you do, Brother Brandon? I looked around and there they was in straight jackets and screaming and cursing and uh, a woman using the bedpan and wiping her face in it. And, uh, excuse that for after eating your breakfast, but uh, just insanity. And there's what your faith has when you preach divine healing. 
I said, well, I just don't know where to start first. And the young lady said, I wished you would start with me first if you don't. I said, you're not a patient. She said, yes, sir. I said, well, uh, what's the matter? She said, Mr. Branham, I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised to honor God. She said, one time I got out with a boy. My mother and father warned me not to go with such a boy. But said he was cute. He had, you know, hair pretty. And, oh, of course, that's, that's all right. Sure. And I don't blame any woman. Uh, look your best and whatever. Be clean and lazy. That's all right. But I just hate to see somebody disfigure themselves. These women don't even look like a human, see. Uh, but look clean. Be like a lady. And man, don't be sloppy. That's not humble. That's dirty, see. Be clean, but don't try to, uh, you know, just don't try to do things like that. Just be just ordinary brother, you see, and just, just be yourself. I hate to see anybody try to put on something that they're really not. Excuse me for leaving this subject a minute. I was down in Florida, and somebody said, I was down there to help this little preacher, David, little David, years ago. And uh, he got in a tight place down there, and I went down to help him. So we had the Lord give us a great crowd out there, and, and so many people I couldn't visit them all. So one of them said, the Duchess wants to see you. I said, the who? I never heard of such a name. Said the Duchess. I said, Well, what's that? Said it's a woman who owns all this estate through here. She let us put this tent here. I said, Well, just look at the hundreds of sick people out there trying to see me too to pray for them. I said, Is she sick? Said, No. She just wants to talk with you a while. Oh, I said, If I got any time, let me spend it with those people there that really need it. Well, they had her around behind the steps of the tent where I come down. I, I hope I'm not saying anything evil. Great big woman standing there with enough jewelry on her hands to, to sponsor a missionary ten times around the world. Stand there. And she had a pair of specs, glasses, on a stick. <laughs> and hold it out like that. Now, you know and I know that you're not going to look through any glasses out like that to see anything. <laughs> but what was it? Putting on the dog. And she looked through there. She said, oh, oh, are you Dr. Branham? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> I said, I'm Brother Branham. She reached her arm way out like this. And she said, I am charmed to meet you. I reached and got a hold of that big fat hand. I said, get it down here so I'll know you want to see you again. See, like that. So, uh, I, see now, what was it? She was just trying to be something that she wasn't. What are you anyhow? Six foot of dirt. That's all. Just a little name of duchess or, or doctor or, or PhD or LLD. That has nothing to do with it. You're a creature of time on the earth. Okay. Now, this young lady, I said to her, what happened? She said, well, a boy, this boy smoked and said he tried to get me smoke and I wouldn't do it. And said, one night he gave me a piece of candy that had been documented, Spanish fly. You bet near, doctors know what that means. So she said, it got me on the wrong road. She said, then I, I ate this candy thinking it was all right. She said, I don't know what happened till the next day in my morals as a young lady was ruined. And she said, then I thought, what's the difference? I started drinking. She said, I joined church. I did everything I know how to do. And she said, then finally I served a time at the Good Shepherd's Home in the Catholic Institution. And I joined the Catholic Church. Thought that would help me. Didn't do it. When I come out, done the same thing. Said I was a street walker, prostitute. Said a drunk, alcoholic. And said, then when I quit that, said they picked me up again. I served two years in woman's penitentiary. And said, when I come out of there, I joined another church and said, didn't do a bit of good. And she said, and I heard about your meetings. I thought I'd come down and see if you could help me. And I looked at her, 
a beautiful woman. I thought, what? wouldn't that be a queen for some little tired evangelist coming in from the field, wore out? The sweet little wife put her arms around him and said, Darling, I know you're tired. You don't know what that does to you. You do. When times are going, there's no one can take the touch of a real sweet wife. Right. Well, if God could have given a man something better, he'd have done it. I thought, what a sweet little thing she could be. I said, I want to ask you something that you never in your life ever feel like at, uh, you'd like to have a hubby and have little babies and be like a, She said, sure, Mr. Brandon. She said, that'd be the desire of my heart. Well, a woman can't think that and be too far off the line. You know. And she said, but who would have me? She said, I'm, you just, I, I wouldn't even speak before a minister the dirty and low down things that I've done. And yet, young woman, maybe 20. And I said, well, uh, can we pray? And she said, yes. I got down and I said, I want you to pray. And you ask God to forgive you of these things. And she said, I've done that so many times. It don't work. I said, well, try it again. She got down and she prayed. She got back up. She said, now, Brother Branham, she says, I'm turning a new page tonight. I said, yep, we'll turn it back again tomorrow. <laughs> and yeah, I said, that won't work. And she said, uh, I said, I want to ask you something. You don't want to do those things, do you, honey? And she said, no, I don't. And I said, this may seem old-fashioned as it could be, but I said, you might join every church, every Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, and all, and you'll have to be the same thing. I said, it's a devil. Those big, bright eyes looked up to me, and she said, Mr. Branham, I've always believed that. I said, something drove me to do things that I don't want to do. I said, that's a demon, a devil power. And she said, I've always believed it. So I said, you pray again. She got down and prayed. She looked over at me again. I prayed for her and laid hands on her. And uh, so she uh, lay there a little while and she looked back. She said, you think it's over? I said, just keep on praying. Well, she prayed a while longer. I was taking plenty of time with her. Just got the case over. After a while, she struck fire. <laughs> when she did, she raised up them eyes a change. She said, something's happened. So now it's over. <laughs> you don't have to join nothing now, sister. She's married and got children. No more drinking. Rosella, are you here? Rosella Griffin, the alcoholic. She was something on that order. How many knows Rosella? Many of you sure. Rosella. There you are. From that time, a certain thing, then from that time, it changed. That's what the immoral woman, the drunk, could say. I was raised as a provisionist. My people didn't believe in drinking, but one time I was with some boys and they called me a sissy if I didn't take a drink, and I took my first drink. And from that time, that's the time it started. One night in a, in a roadhouse, one night parked on the side of the road when my girlfriend gave me a drink. From that time, it started. New Year's, they turn a new page. Good intention, don't do no good. That don't help anything. I used to see my father throw away his chewing tobacco on on New Year's and say, I'll never chew it no more and watch where he throwed it. <laughs> so I could pick it up the next day, you see. And I see him throw his bottle away and then you know, watch what he done with it, you see. Because you, you turning pages don't do no good. It takes something to happen inside. If, any doctor will tell you, if you put something on the outside and heal the sore over on the outside, it'll only make it worse if it isn't. It has to heal from the inside out. And that's why Christianity is. It isn't jarring in church or something. It's healing from the inside, coming out. Your conversion comes from the inside, the core, the spirit, the life. After the First World War, many of you young fellows don't remember this. Us older men remember. I was just a boy, nine years old. But I remember they said, we'll have no more wars after the First World War. It's all settled. They found a thing called gas and we, we just can't, you, we will never be able to, to survive another war because that it's, uh, uh, they, they we're going to fix an idea that we'll never have any more wars. That's all. We're settling for good. So, but they had other wars. 
they find they finally organized the thing called the uh, I believe it was called the League of Nations and we're going to take so many soldiers out of every nation and we're going to have a police guard and if anybody gets out of the roof one of this so many out of this nation so many we're going to go say sit down John because the nations are just a bunch of boys just a family that's all there is to it like a house to God and we're going to police them and we're going to have the League of Nations but they had war just the same now they've got the UN but we've got war just the same you see so uh, when we form the UN and we get all the nations into it now Russia's out and this and that see there's none of those things you, you can't put your hands on that not a thing the young couple one time there was a young couple would get married and the young couple might have said um, John and Mary and how fine they live together and they might have said um, that uh, I am um, perhaps maybe I'm taking too long and holding this uh, meeting too long what time we have to leave brother? that's what time oh I didn't know we're sorry brother just a few minutes and we yes sir thank you sir we didn't know that we're supposed to have left the ten. Let's go just a little farther. It was fine and dandy till one time a little curly-headed salesman come in and talked her into something wrong and broke up her home from that time. You say, Brother Branham, you're telling us this morning of how many things that's happened and what's taken place and all this, that, and the other. Is there anything that can happen that stands eternally? Yes. When a man meets God, there was a man named Abraham, just an ordinary man. But one day he met God, and from that time he was changed forever. He believed something that he could not see. When he met God, he was changed. Moses, a runaway servant, he didn't think he was supposed to deliver the children of Israel. But he ran away, and he didn't know how to do it. His military training wouldn't let him do it. But one day he met God. He was a changed man. And when a man meets God, it makes him act different than he ever did act. Could you imagine a Moses? How ridiculous when you meet God, what it will make you act. Billy, did you say we had 10 minutes about? 10 minutes, sorry. Uh, how do you make, look at Moses. Here one day he's a sheep herder, a prince of Egypt, run away on the backside of the desert. Back on the backside of the desert, herding sheep, afraid to go to Israel, uh, go down to Egypt, rather. And here he is on the backside of the desert. The next morning, here he is with his wife sitting straddle a mule with a young and on her hip, whiskers hanging this low, 80 years old, his bald head shining, a stick in his hand. Here he goes, glory to God, hallelujah, walking. Where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. One man invasion. <laughs> Why? He had met God. Where he was running now, he was going back to take over. And he done it because he had met God. And from that time, the burning bush, Moses was a different character after he met God. That's right. Mary, the little virgin, never had a woman bore a child without being uh, an intercourse with man. Never had she never been able to to ever be able to have a child without natural pollen, but she believed God. And before she felt any life or anything else, the angel's word was good enough for her. She met the Lord, said, Hail Mary, blessed art thou amongst women. You're going to have a child, knowing no man. She said, Behold the hands made of the Lord. And from that time, Mary never waited till she was positive. Why would we wait till we were positive? We've got to see our hand come straight, our foot come straight, the belly ache stop. Not her, the angel of the Lord, his message is good enough for her. She's starting around testifying, hallelujah, I'm going to have the baby, knowing no man. Why? She met God. That was the difference. Peter, when he met God and Jesus revealed to him who he was, from that time he was an apostle. Paul, the little hook-nosed Jew, sarcastic, going down there with a letter in his pocket to arrest all them people, shouting and speaking in tongues. He's going to put them in jail. He had an uh, order from the high church to do it. 
but he met God. And from that time, oh wow, he was a different man when he met God. One time a dirty, stinking leper laid at the gate, and Jesus came through and he said, If thou wilt, thou can make me clean. From that time, he had no leprosy. Why? He met God. And that's it. A, a immoral woman met God. One time at the well, she had five husbands and lived with the six. He told her the very secret of her heart, and from that time, she was a messenger of God to the city. Come see a man who told me what I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? When you meet God, it changes things. From that time, it changes things. It certainly does. It does it for all people. There was a blind man one time, met God, and from that time, he could see Certainly, as soon as he met God. Now, we got a lot more we could say, but to hurry, I want to make one statement here. Death met God one time, and it never was the same afterwards. The devil always doubted that being the Son of God. He thought, if that was him up there on a mountain, why didn't he perform a miracle before me? When he took him down there and put that rag around his eyes and hit him on the head and said, If you are a prophet, if you can discern the thoughts of the heart, now you tell us who hit you. We'll believe you. They thought, surely that can't be God. They let somebody pull the beard out of his face and hawk with drunken spit of a soldier and spit in his face, and that be God? And then stand there and not say a word about it. He said, That couldn't be God. God is smiting dead. See, he just don't know the nature of God. A lot of people try to be, I'm so and so, step out like that. That's not God. The way down is up. His humility proved to me he was God. What he was, humble, sweet. Now, the devil thought that wasn't God. Let's take a look at him just as we're watching. Watch how death met him and what happened to death. How could that be God being a man? Why, he was born down there out of holy wedlock. His mother probably had that baby, but Joseph, this old man, 45 years old, her 16, why, he is the father of four or five children, and then go ahead and marry this young girl. Why, that baby is born out of holy wedlock. That's how they had to turn. That's exactly the way the people believed it. Born under, out of holy wedlock. They believed that. The illegitimate child. How could that be God? It couldn't be God. So I see him going up the hill. Let's, let's go to Jerusalem for the next three minutes or five. I, we're talking. I hear a noise. Let's go look out the window, raise it up. I hear something going bump, bump, bump. It's an old cross coming up the street. He had one garment on his back, wove throughout without a seam. A howling mob. I see a little woman run out in front and say, What has he done? But heal your sick. Make gentlemen out of your criminals. What has he done but brought us hopes of life? A big rough hand smacked her across the street and said, Would you listen to that woman instead of your bishop, your priest? What's he done? I look at him. He's little, a cross dragon. I see some little red spots on the back of his coat that's got across his shoulder. What are they? On up the hill he goes. And spots begin to come bigger and bigger, larger. And after a while, they all run into one big spot. Splash now, it's blood. Dragging the footprints out as it comes up. I can see the bee of death say, you want me to go now, Satan? Yeah, he, he is. That's not God. He's not even a prophet. You wouldn't stand there. He'd curse that bunch of people if he was a prophet. Hey, that's not him. Go on, be stinging. Anchor him. We've got him now. I see that bee of death begin to hum around him, buzz around him. Brother, anybody knows an insect that has a stinger like a bee? If it ever stings deep, he don't have no stinger no more. He stuck his stinger in the wrong flesh then. 
He stuck it in Emmanuel's flesh. The bee of death stung him. Death met God. Since then, he don't have any stinger. He pulled his flesh. He depowered him. He couldn't sting no more. One named Paul, when they were building a, a place, a scaffold there in Rome to chop his head off, that bee began to hum around him, make a noise. He said, oh, death, where is your stinger? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when death met God, God pulled the stinger out of death. Something happened to death when it met God. And today, when we go to face him, death can buzz, but it can't sting. It hasn't got any stinger. Let us pray. Father, I'm so glad that death has no stinger. It can fuss, buzz around, and try to make us a scared. We can stand like Paul of old. We've had that same experience that we have passed from death because we've been hid in a body called Jesus Christ that pulled the very stinger of death out of us. So we have the muddy grave can no longer hold the believer, for he rose again, and as he rose, we rise with him. For those that are dead in Christ will God bring with him at his coming. God, if there's someone here this morning who has never met Christ, as I would like to have spoke of it, may they meet him this morning, and their lives will be changed from now on. Grant it, Lord. Now, we had asked that you would bless these lovely women that helped us in this, this institution of this Methodist college here, of their courtesy of letting us have this room. God, I pray that young men coming from here will be real missionaries and men of God. Grant it, Lord. May something be done or said that will turn their hearts so to God that they'll be real uh, second John Wesley's come out of here, God. Grant it. Bless the deans and all. Bless us together. Bless the services tonight and the oncoming services. Bless our ministering brethren here and all that's gathered together. And we'll praise thee through this, our time and eternity. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now don't forget the sisters' tips on the table, if you will. And God be with you until we meet tonight. All right. God bless you.